Good morning, Christian Life Center. I said good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? Can somebody give a shout of praise in this place? Who's excited to be in the house of the Lord? Let's put our hands together like this. Just like a tree that grows by the water Let the strong winds blow, I will not move Just like a child secure in the love of the Father situation no room for fear and doubt no matter what I'm facing the song of my heart is ringing out I stand on your promise I will not be moved nothing can tear us apart my faith won't be shaken I'm anchored in you in death and in life you
loves you in this place. You may be seated as we continue. Good morning, CLC. You look mighty good idea this morning. I, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing you to an annual event that takes place within the Assemblies of God as well as churches throughout our United States. <clears throat> as many of you may already know, the month of October across the country has been designated as, pre as Pastors Appreciation Month. While we here at CLC honor our pastors throughout the year, um, myself as treasurer of the board of Christian Life Center, uh, along with the board, would like to take this time out to honor our pastors and express our appreciation to them with a small gift. What I will do is to call each of our pastors up by name and ask that you hold your applause until the very end. Now, there are some pastors who are not with us today because they are pastors at our satellite sites. And therefore, what we will be doing is to showing all of our pastors on the screen uh, behind me. You will also note that if you are not familiar with those pastors, that their names would be on that screen as well. So as if you will, without further ado, you notice that our pastors are coming up uh, and we would like to in alphabetical order to recognize our pastors. I have with me uh, David, who's also a board member, who would be giving to each of our pastors a token of our appreciation. So we thank you uh, each and every one for recognizing these pastors during the last week or so. And today, we would like to begin by having Pastor David and Michelle. Pastor David. I told y'all not to clap. <laughs> I had to get that out, I'm sorry. Uh, Pastor David and Michelle, they are the discipleship and spiritual formation pastors. Next, we have Pastor Eric and Jessica, who are the Surge Kids pastors. Pastor Fabiana and Chris, youth ministry. Pastor Kevin and Deborah, music and vibe young adults. Pastor Christian and Danielle, Family Life and Next Gen. Pastor Nadine and Benz, Executive Pastor of Operations. Pastor Sean and Melissa, Community Outreach. Pastor Tim, Youth Ministry. Pastor Veronica, Care nursing home and visitations. Last but not least, the senior shepherd of the flock. Now you can help. Thank you, thank you, thank you for showing your appreciation to this great uh, uh, pastors that we have here on staff at CLC. I believe of all churches, we are most blessed to have pastors such as these. Amen. So, so if, since you have already given them their, your, your exuberance, I would ask that you stand as we now pray 
uh, for our pastors. If you would just point your hands toward them, according to Hebrews 6.10, it, it reminds us that God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and love you have shown him as you have ministered to his people and continue to minister to them. We give thanks to God for the lives of our pastors, their families, and the ministry which they have provided us. So God, in your precious name, a hedge of protection is now being asked to be God surrounding each pastor that's represented on this stage today. Lord, I pray that you would look upon their ministry, O oh God, with great favor, that you would bless them, O oh God, and everything that they do, Lord, for the good of the kingdom and the shepherd and that you have given to us, O oh God. I pray that their shepherding would be God-directed and focused and that your people will be the benefactors of great teaching and and. And, and, and preaching, oh God, and, and that we would see an immense salvation within our midst as a result of the work of these pastors. Lord, have mercy upon them. Bless them in their coming and goings. In the precious name of Jesus, our Lord, amen and amen. Uh, you, I'm sorry, you're doing a yo-yo here. You can remain standing. We're going to go back into worship in a moment. But on behalf of the pastors, first of all, we want you to know how much we love you as a congregation. And it is an honor for us. It's a privilege. We thank you for appreciating us and honoring us. But it is our honor and it's our privilege to work among you, to minister among you, and to allow God to do what he's going to continue to do. You know, for years I've prayed that God would help us to love you you as a congregation, that we would love you like Christ loved the bride, we would love you, that we would be able to share God's word with you. We would preach the word with an anointing that enables you to understand and live out the truth of his word, and that God would give us passion to do what he's called us to do, to make a major impact, to make a, uh, make a difference in this world, especially here in South Florida. And we have a phenomenal pastoral team that serves you each and every week, and we love them. It's a joy to serve with them. Uh, honestly, they uh, enable us to do as a church what we do. Pastor Candy and I's part is a very, very small, small part. And what they do is huge in advancing the work of the kingdom. And what I love about our pastoral team is we come from all over the world. I mean, we're a, we have eight different nationalities on our pastoral team. We have Americans. Uh, Eric is Greek. Uh, so we have a European. Uh, Jessica is from Puerto Rico. So Puerto Rican. We have a Brazilian right here. We've got a Haitian right here. We got another Puerto Rican, Colombian right here. El Salvador? Peru, Peru, you know, married to a Michiganer, however you say that, I don't know. That's a nation of its own. Another Jamaican, another Puerto Rican. You what? He said he's Haitian. <laughs> he's, a, he's a white Haitian. <laughs> Another Jamaican. We have a Cuban. A Cuban over at the Spanish campus. We have three, three pastors that are not here because they're at our campuses. We have a Nigerian. <laughs> A Nigerian that's over uh, at Sunrise uh, Campus, and I'm somewhere in the middle. I don't know where I'm at, but I'm somewhere there. And uh, and I married this uh, this blonde. At least she's been a blonde all my life. And. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's just a joy to serve with this pastoral team, to serve among you. And we want you to know that we love you and we're excited to see what God's going to continue to do in the future. Amen. Let's give our team one more time a big round of applause. Our worship team's coming out. We're going to continue to worship. So remain standing as we enter deeper into the presence of the Lord. Are you ready to worship the Lord? Lift your hands, lift your hands, and Father, we invite you right now to just come and move among us, oh God. Move in our midst, we pray. Have your way. Touch us, we ask, in your name. Amen and amen.
How many guys know that we serve the lion and the lamb? Somebody shout hallelujah. Put those hands together. There's no one like you, Lord. He's coming on the clouds. The kings and kingdoms will blow down. As every chain will break, has broken hearts declare his praise. For who Start singing. The Lion of Judah, he's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Sing, I got. God. God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow. Church, if you believe that, put those hands together. There's no one like you, Jesus. No. Here you sing. So open up the gates. So open up. says we believe that every knee will bow every tongue shall confess that you are the most high God this is why we say for who can stop the Lord Almighty yes who can stop the Lord Almighty we say who can stop the Lord Almighty who can stop the come on can you just declare it over your situation to sing lyrics on a screen. I don't know if you guys heard me. It's easy to just sing lyrics on a screen. But how do you guys really believe what we're declaring? That the God we serve is a lion of Judah. He was a lamb that was slain for you and I. If you believe that, can you just raise your hands in the air? We have victory in the name of Jesus. There's people in this room who may be battling depression, 
be reminded that you have victory in the name of Jesus. There may be some people in this room that are worrying, that may have doubt, but be reminded you have victory in the name of Jesus. There is people in this room who is sick in their bodies, who has pain in a certain area, but be reminded there is victory in the name of Jesus. There's no one like you, Lord. There's no one like you, Lord. Church, if you believe that, can't you just raise your hands and sing this line with us all over this room. We sing, for who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Church, declare it. Who can stop the Lord? It doesn't matter what the situation may look like. Sing, who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord? Say, who can stop the Lord? Oh, there's no one like you, Jesus. Say, who can stop the Lord? We worship you, Lord. We magnify your name. There's no greater name than the name of Jesus. There's no greater name than the name of Jesus. Church, can we just worship that name all over this room? In your own way, just begin to, just begin to tell them how much you love them, how much you adore the name. Lord, we adore your name. We magnify your name. The presence of the mighty God is here. The presence of the mighty God is here, church. Let us continue to exalt his name all over this room. He's one name that holds away up them all. His faith outlasts the earth he formed. And his prayer. Experience his grace. Sing his grace. His grace is as boundless. As boundless as his love. Sing he reigns with healing. healing in his Just stretch your hands. We sing. Lift up our eyes. See the King has come. The light of the world reaching out for us. There is no other name. There is no other name. Jesus Christ our triumph of the cross we sing behold the triumph, the triumph of the cross. if you believe that can you declare from the depths of your soul sing his power his
that there are so many things that are taking our attitude, taking our heart, bringing doubt. There's chains that need to be broken over your family. There's pornography in this room. You know who you are. God is speaking in our lives. We are going to be a healthy church. We're going to ask God to remove the things that separate us from the clarity of the Holy Spirit speaking into our spirit so that when we walk out there, we know how to live. We know how to walk. We know how to walk in faith. We know how to see what God is doing. We know how to have understanding that God gives. If you want to come down here this morning, we're going to take a moment, and I'm asking you, cry out to the Lord and ask him and say, Lord, speak. Lord, break chains. Father, I speak over my house. I need a healthy house. I need to get rid of some stuff out of my house. I need to get rid of some distractions out of my home. I need to know the truth that sets me free. I'm anchored in the Word, and the Word is what brings truth into my mind. It gives me what I need. There are several of you that just come this morning. If you don't know the Lord Jesus is your Savior, I call upon you to reach up your hand and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Lord, I reach out to you, God, and I'm asking you to do a work because I believe you died on the cross to set me free. It's because of the cross and the resurrection that we stand this morning. It's because of the cross and the resurrection that you stand in your freedom. I want to call upon the name of the Lord. Can you just ask the Lord if this is new to you? I want to invite you just to put your hands out and say, God, I don't know what they're talking about, but Lord, I just want what you got for me this morning. I want to hear your speak. I want to have an intimate relationship. Let's pray and let's worship this morning. Let's ask the Lord, what is he wanting to do in our lives? Come on, church. The earth will shake this tremble. start to speak to the Lord talk to him for a moment those of you maybe have not talked to the Lord in a long time I want to encourage you to talk to him as you talk to your dearest friend speak to him right now Lord I pray God that you would heal heal Lord Jesus 
heal over this room. Jesus, I pray for restoration, Lord Jesus. I pray, God, for the brokenhearted, Lord God. Heal the brokenhearted, Lord Jesus. Oh, speak, Lord Jesus. Speak, Lord God. Over our lives, God, into our homes, Lord Jesus. We plead the blood of Jesus over our homes, God. God, I pray, God, that you would restore homes, Lord Jesus. Bring salvation to our homes, Lord Jesus. Oh, God, we speak out the names, Lord Jesus, that need to know you, Lord God. Oh, Father, I pray that you would break the areas of our lives, Lord Jesus, that are not pleasing to your sight, God. Lord, you love us so much to have a desired relationship with us, God. Lord, I pray, God, that our hearts and our minds would be renewed in you, Lord Jesus. Oh, this morning, God, we ask you for a renewed spirit, Lord Jesus. A renewed heart, Lord Jesus. Jesus, I pray. Because healing is here. Come on. Healing is here. Yes, Lord. Healing is here. Do you believe in? And I receive. That can be physically, emotionally, mentally. Healing is here. Call upon the name of the Lord this morning. Come on, church. Healing is here. And I receive it. Sing, I reach my hand.
Just lift that chorus just one more time, real soft. Sing, I reach my hands, I reach my hands, I reach my I want to encourage you. The Lord knows you by name. He knows you before you were born. He knows where you're at. He knows where you've been. And he knows where you're going. And as Pastor Tom has been using this, using the word to be the anchor in your life, I encourage you, encourage you desperately at this hour that what's being shared with you, that you would apply it to your life. If you know that there's areas in your life and you're just needing some help, write down on your, on your connection card today and saying, you know what, I need extra prayer in this. I'm believing God in this area of my life. We read those, every single one. We believe and we pray with you. I want to encourage you today that the Lord has something that needs to be spoken into your life today as you understand that what Pastor Tom will say to you, you need to go home and you need to obey it. You need to obey it quickly. Because the snare of the enemy outside that is snaring your mind, you've got to be able to reject it to get your mind focused. Me and another lady today... Another lady came up and spoke to me, and she said, this was the word the Lord had told her, and it was the exact same thing the Lord has been speaking. We are in very, very, very perilous times. I've said this, and I'll say it again. There's a stench that the enemy has been released to allow to where our minds and confusion can come and misdirection and misguidance like never before. And the word of God has to go to another level in our lives. The Word of God has to be memorized. The Word of God has to be the truth that anchors because that's how you're going to have a clear mind. You're not going to be confused. You're going to have understanding. I want us to believe that today, that the Lord loves you enough to know that He sees everything and He desires to work in a miraculous way in your life, but obedience is necessary. There cannot be one way or another. It has to be right on target. You have to be extremely, extremely careful because these days and hours are very, very dark. And I pray, I want us to agree together over our homes right now. You just agree with me, Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I just petition angels, Lord, to our homes. God, I ask you that you would stand. God, that you would convict us, Lord, if there's anything, Lord, any wayward way, that God, we would, we would find our lives being anchored like you've called us to in your word. Lord, that we would be a healthy people. That, God, that our lives would be enriched by your spirit and our guidance would be in our heart and our mind directed towards you, Lord. So that, that we would see what you desire to do. We would see those promises come forth in our lives, Lord. Not the way of man, but the way of God. Lord, that's going to look differently. It's not going to look the way that man has said it. But it's going to look differently. And I ask you, God, to help us to miraculously open up our hearts and our minds to receive what you desire to do in us today. Healing and broken, Lord, broken chains in our lives are what we desire, Lord, so that we can walk in the fullness and the richness of who you are. In Jesus' name.
as you're heading to your seats, uh, if you can, can you take about just 30 seconds to just lift your voice and just thank him? Not put your hands together, but just lift your voice. Begin just to thank him for what he's just been doing. Can we lift our voices? Father, we thank you. We praise you, Lord. You're in this place. We thank you. You are awesome. You are holy. You are worthy. Do you believe that today, church? Do you believe that today, church? We serve an awesome God. An awesome God. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for just gathering us here. Now, just so you know, here at Christian Life Center, we don't want to just do church, but we really want to experience God. Amen. I do hope and pray you've already been sensing his presence. So I'm going to get through this section and really uh, as quick as I can because I do believe that Pastor Tom has a powerful word that is just right on time for this uh, week specifically. So um, I, I welcome everybody to Christian Life Center. I'm Pastor Kevin, one of our staff pastors. But particularly, if you're visiting here for the first time, can you just give me a wave just so we can acknowledge you and thank you for joining us? Thank you so much for joining us. We hope and pray that this wouldn't be your last time. But as, uh, just before we move on in that section there, can everyone go ahead and just grab their bulletins and grab the connection cards inside of that bulletin at this time as we move forward. Those of you who are visiting here for the first time, first of all, thank you for coming. We have actually some information that we'd like to give to you. And we even have a free gift that we'd like to personally give to you. If you're interested in receiving some more information about Christian Life Center, and even see how you can, can, how you, can um, you and your family be a part of our church at the end of the service, Head out those double doors to your right. There's an open area called the Connection Center. There will be some leaders there just to greet you. And in exchange for that card that you're filling out at this time, we'll be able to give you information about our church as well as that free gift that I just mentioned. But in order to get that information, those of you who are here for the first time, please fill out that card completely entirely with your name and information on it. Now, those of you who are regular attenders and members, that connection card that I asked you to grab as well, just print your first and last name on it, letting us know that you're joining us today. And if there's any changes in your contact information, please make the uh, those changes accordingly so that we have the best way of contacting you and keeping you updated what's going on here at Christian Life Center. Once again, welcome every person here in the house of the Lord. Why don't you touch your neighbor? Say, I'm happy to see you in the house of the Lord. All right, touch your other neighbor. Let them know I'm happy to see you in the house of the Lord. Just two quick announcements I want to give, and then we'll go straight into the offering. Um, first of all, we have Light the Night coming up uh, next week. Anyone excited that God gives us the opportunity to impact our world? We have Light the Night next week. We actually need your help. First of all, if you have candy or you're able to donate candy, we need you to be able to drop that off here at our campus so that we can have enough candy to distribute to those families that, or those kids that will be here on the campus. If you do not know what Light the Night is, this is our opportunity to light the night for Jesus Christ. And it's not just candy we're giving out, but we're giving out the message of hope. We're preaching the gospel so that families and kids can hear the gospel and get saved and be able to experience what we get to experience on a weekly basis. So please, 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 if you can, can donate uh, some candy so that we can be able to have enough to facilitate that evening. If um, you want to know how you can be a part of that evening or serving that evening, if you have not already signed up through your life group, I want to encourage you, if you would grab your connection cards and on the right section, you can place LTN, which stands for Light Tonight. We need lots and lots of help. We're actually praying that God will give us over 600 volunteers, right? 600 volunteers we need uh, and more because we're going to be needing people with, um, uh, with friendly faces to help welcome families and be Jesus' hands and feet extended to the many families that will be presented here on that particular evening. We need help with registration bounce houses, these different things to be able to help every family that comes on our campus feel welcome and proper, properly be ministered to and cared for. If you're interested in serving on that evening, please place LTN on the connection card, which stands for Light Denight, and we'll be able to reach out to you to let you know where we can use your help and you can help us to be able to facilitate the families or, or help and care for the, the families that will be here on that campus. Last but not least, if you are a business owner, we have an amazing opportunity for you. In our Christmas production that's going to be coming up in two months or so, um, you have an opportunity to be able to place an ad for your business in the Christmas production uh, program. We have over 5,000 people that comes on this particular weekend, which is a great opportunity to be able to let just our community know what it is that your business or the services that your business provides for those in our community. So if you're interested in that, head out the double doors at the end of the service and head to Kiosk 3, which is on the west side, and you'll be able to see a uh, kiosk 
kiosks there um, for you to be able to fill out a packet and see what are the details are so that you can get your business in the Christmas uh, production that's going to be, or the program of the Christmas production that's coming up in just a few months. So I invite all of you to be a part of that if you have a business so um, that God, uh, God can use your business to continue to make a greater impact. Amen. Uh, just, because, just for sake of time, um, we're going to go ahead and just uh, ask the red carpet team to uh, head down so we can go straight into the offering. How many people know that God has called us all to be kingdom builders? Anyone grateful to be a kingdom builder? Quick story I want to share with you really quickly. Um, there was a woman, actually, she... Um, this year, God had opened a specific door for her to now have a new role at her job, and she doesn't want to disclose uh, her name, um, but to have a, a new role at her job. And um, she took on the role and took on this particular job. And what was crazy is that that same time, it was actually the same time that we were going into the financial fitness series. How many people were blessed by the financial fitness series? Amen. So now at this particular time, she was praying on her heart because she was already fa um, tithing 10%. Was as far as what else could she do? And the Lord placed upon her heart to tithe 12%. Wow, faith, right? What was crazy is right when she stepped into the new role and also began to tithe that 10, 12%, excuse me, God had already sent, she didn't realize that God had already made a way for her to actually get a promotion that was almost the exact amount of that 12% that she stepped into. Talk about faith, right? Can we give God praise for that? You never know how God is going to bless you whenever it is that you decide to obey him. And we're not obeying him so he can bless us. We obey him because he's good and he's faithful. His faithfulness endures from generation to generation. As you're giving this morning, I want to encourage you to know that you can never outgive God. And as God blesses you, determine in your heart that you will be a blessing to advance his kingdom. Amen. There's many different ways that you can give this morning. You can give by way of text, or you can give um, by way of uh, uh, the envelope that's in the rack in front of you. Um, I just want to encourage you, whatever the method is, let it be from your heart as, as worship unto the Lord. Amen? So let's go ahead and go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you that you have given us this opportunity to give. We give cheerfully because we know you do that, that you love a cheerful giver. So, Father, we give uh, uh, out of obedience to you, trusting that you would bless us to be a blessing. So, Father, I pray for that person who took on the tithe challenge that's still waiting to or waiting for you to come through for them. I pray that they would not lose hope. They would not get discouraged because, Lord, every good and perfect thing comes from you, Lord, and you will bless those who obey your commands. And those who are on the fence about it this morning, may they give knowing that all the glory is given to you and even what they receive is for your glory. We pray all this, and we pray you would multiply this offering. Use it to advance your kingdom. In Jesus' name, everyone say, amen. God bless you as you give this morning. today. Amen. Wow, it's wonderful to be able to enter into the presence of the Lord. You know, we're coming towards the end of our Anchored series, and today uh, is going to be a very important part of how God's Word, and we've been likening it to an anchor to our life, how God's Word transforms us. And I'm going to give you three simple keys. It's really simple, but it's not the simplicity of the Word that makes it difficult. It's the application of it to our life. And so I want to be able to give you some practical ways how these three keys can bring transformation to your life. We've been saying that we've got to be tied to the Word, anchored in the Word, build our lives on the Word. The problem is, is a lot of people around us, many maybe even here this morning in our auditorium, are building their lives, even as Christians, on other things other than the Word of God. Some people are building their lives on pop culture and what's popular today. 
if stars are doing it, entertainers are doing it, sports figures are doing it, if everyone else is doing it, then it must be popular, it must be right, is the philosophy and the mindset. But that will not last. It will not enable you to be what God wants you to be. In fact, the Bible says don't follow the crowd in doing wrong because when we follow the crowd in their doing wrong, it's going to lead us down a wrong path. So just because everybody else is doing it doesn't make it right. We know. Or some people, because they've always done it a certain way, because they grew up doing it a certain way. We allow tradition sometimes to be the things that dictate, especially when it comes to our relationship with the Lord and how we connect with God and serve God. But tradition isn't always right. And the problem with tradition is it doesn't last either. And that's why we're saying you got to be anchored to the Word of God. Some people, they follow their region. reason, their their logic. If it's reasonable, if it seems logical, if it seems right, then it must be right. And they start building their lives on that which is reasonable. Now, let's be honest. Most of us have gotten caught in this trap. We begin to plan it. We strategize it. If you're someone that likes to be in control of things, you're plotting, you're working. If you're a C personality, everything's got to be lined up. You got to figure it all out. It's got to be reasonable. It's got to be logical. It's not logical sometimes and we won't do it. But God works with us in faith. God moves with us in a spiritual realm. And can we be honest, the spiritual realm doesn't always make sense to us in the natural realm. And so just because it's logical doesn't mean that it's right. The problem with that kind of, uh, uh, that kind of, uh, you know, reason of how we live our life and how we make decisions and things like that is that our reasoning is not infallible. We can make bad decisions. We may not have all the facts. We may not see how God sees. And that's why we're saying the more we get anchored in the Word and get into the Word and tie our lives to the Word, it will change our lives. And then some people, and this is a very important one, they're driven by emotion. They allow their emotions to drive them. And they're building their lives simply on how do they feel. If it feels right, do it. If it feels right, it must be right. But the problem is, again, is our feelings will lie to us. In fact, can I tell you, you lie to yourself more than you lie to anybody else. That's the truth. We convince ourselves, we rationalize it, we make it feel right. And if it feels right, we think it is right. And many people, not even knowing the word, Christians as well, don't know the word. They just go by their feelings. And so they begin to tell you what they think is right by how they feel and what they've believed, but their belief has been, been, been transformed by the logic of this world and the philosophies of this world that sometimes they're going down a path without even realizing it. They're charting their own course biblically, making a gospel of their own because it feels right. And that's a challenge for us. In fact, if we live by our moods, our emotions, we'll be very, very moody. We'll, we'll do what we want when we want. In fact, that is what we call immaturity. Let's be honest. When somebody is driven by their emotions, that individual can be very, very immature. Maturity in God comes from understanding the wisdom of God and living by our values. And as Christians, our values come from the word and those values become convictions. Convictions are priorities. Convictions are guardrails. Convictions are what we build our lives on. It becomes the values of our life and that's what guides us. I mean, we see examples in the word. Judges 21, the nation of Israel, it says about the nation of Israel when there was no king that everyone did whatever they felt like doing. And boy, even though we have presidents and prime ministers and and politicians, it feels like today everybody's just doing whatever they want to do, right? If they don't like it, watch out. You're in trouble. I'm in trouble. Someone told me last night, Pastor, I don't even drive anymore at night because it scares me to be out at dark. I mean, we're living in a world that makes it very, very difficult if we don't understand what our values are, what our convictions are. And therefore, this whole series 
has been a series of helping us learn how. Not just telling you you should. You know you should be anchored to the Word. You know you should read the Bible. You know it's a good thing. You know it'll bring change. It'll bring direction. It'll bring wisdom. It'll help you in temptation. You know that. The problem is, is we don't know how to. We don't know how to get anchored in it. We don't know how to understand it. We don't know how to get life out of it. So every week, we've been trying to help you to understand how to look into God's Word and let it change, and today, how to transform you. So we've been having this nautical theme, uh, anchored, and we've been talking about uh, the purposes of anchored and, and, uh, and what we do out in the ocean and sea and boat and all of that. And so today, what we've got is we've got a nautical map. Now, a nautical map is very different than other maps. Now, many of you don't even know what a map looks like anymore. All you have is your GPS or Siri on your phone. But this is a map. This is what we used to read uh, when we would, like, have to drive somewhere. And this is a boating map. And what's unique about a nautical map, you can't see it here, so we've got it up on the screen. And uh, what's unique about a nautical map is it's very, very different than just looking at a map of the ocean because a nautical map, it makes maps out the waterways and the ocean. And it begins to show you information, information that's very, very helpful for a boater. It shows you the channels. It shows you the depth of water. These numbers show you depth of water. It begins to show you where the markers are. It'll show you uh, uh, longitude and latitude. It'll show you where the reefs are. It'll show you where wreckage is even, where, where I'm right off of Pompano Beach here. There's a wreckage there, and you can go snorkeling out around it. The, the nautical map will show you that. It'll show you danger areas. It'll show you distances from one place to another place. Now, a boater will not make a long-distance trip without studying the nautical maps, knowing where he's going, and while they're out there, they'll keep an eye on the map. They'll keep an eye on the course that they're charting, where they're going, so that they don't drift off course course and they stay in the area that will not be in uh, any way dangerous to them. Well, obviously, that's what God's Word does for you and I. Now, we're teaching you today how do you get the most out of the map of God's Word? How do you study it, look at it, hold it so that it really keeps you on course, bringing the transformation in your life that God desires it to be? In fact, today our memory verse is going to come out of Psalms 119 that talks about God's word is like a lamp unto my feet that will light my path. In fact, uh, many times they would have lanterns, uh, lanterns obviously that would help them to study the charts and maybe uh, the media team and, 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 and guys can help me. Let me turn on my light here. And uh, we would have lanterns and as we would turn on the lanterns, uh, they would be able to study their charts at night, keep an eye on the charts. You see, that was the problem with the Titanic is they, they didn't pay attention. And God's word says, listen, my word is like a lamp unto your feet. I mean, how many times have you gotten up at night and you've stumbled across the room, stubbed your toe, kicked something on accident because the light wasn't on? I was out boating a few weeks ago with a, with a few of our team members. We were out there fishing. I was actually with Pastor Sean over here. Pastor Sean, I'm telling you the truth, not a fishing story. He caught such a big fish, it snapped the fishing pole in half. I mean, literally just snapped it in half. I don't know what it was, but it was big. And we were trying to, you know, string the line at night when it got dark and we didn't have a light. We didn't have a lantern and we couldn't see. Well, God's word is a light unto your path. It guides you. It leads you. It enables you to chart out a course in your life that will keep you out of the rocks, will keep you out of danger. Some of you, if you would have followed the word of God in your life that you knew growing up, that you studied as a, long, uh, as a young person, if you would have stayed on the path and continued to let God's word light your course, you wouldn't have landed into some of the decisions and some of the situations that you did. And that's why God says, we've got to allow his word to be a light unto our path. Can I hear an amen in the house? So let me turn that off so we don't cause any problems here uh, uh, as we're looking deeper into the word today. So my anchoring scripture 
is Psalm 119. Psalm 119, I want us to look at it because it really helps us to understand this transformation that comes out of the Word. Now, I have it in your outline. If, uh, if you don't have your Bibles or if you want to click in your devices uh, or turn over, Psalm 119, we're going to read a few verses starting in verse 97. Psalm 119, verse 97 from the NIV translation. The psalmist says, oh, how I love your law. Can I hear an amen? The law is the word of God. It's the scripture of God's word. I love your law. I meditate, circle it on it day, all day long. Your commandments, your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all of my teachers, for I meditate on your statues. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey your word. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself, uh, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. Here's our memory verse this week. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it that I will follow your righteous laws. Father, I thank you for your word. And as we open it in these few moments we have together today, I pray that you will illuminate the keys that bring transformation and let us embrace it with a willing heart to say, God, let it be so in our life. In your name we pray, amen and amen. So today... Three simple keys. It's a simple message that I share with you today. The first key is that we have to meditate on the Word. Say meditate. The key to discovering and applying Scripture to your life is meditation. Meditation of the Word. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, uh, meditation like maybe the world does it. In fact, today we're going to give you some ideas on how God shows us in His Word that we meditate. How we take a passage of the Bible and we begin to read it and concentrate on it and apply it to our life. Where then, as we read the Word, if it, it appears that, that we've drifted off course, that we can come back in. That it gives us the information that we need to apply to our life. That we can anticipate danger, look at what's ahead, and we can really, really know what to do as we were, read the Word. Now, the definition, really, of meditation is digesting in thought. That you're thinking on it. You're processing it. It's beginning getting to transform you in the innermost being of who you are. That when you read the Bible, you look at a passage of the Bible, that you concentrate on it and you look at it from different directions. The problem for many believers is that they're not taking time to concentrate on the Word. If and that's a big question. If they're even having devotions, they're reading really fast. They're clicking off a, a Bible reading plan. They've got the, the, you know, the U version, and they're just clicking off passages to make them feel like they're connecting with God. It's not the speed. It's not how fast I can go through the book. It's is the book going through you? Is the book transforming you? Is it changing you? Is it changing your life? And therefore, we read it. We concentrate on it. We look at it. We glean from it. We apply it to our life. We look to Christ and we begin to ask, am I reflecting his nature? Am I walking in his path? Is my mind being changed? Is my life being changed? Is my attitudes being changed? Is my character being changed? Is the word going through you? One of the convictions that I have for us is that we're not taking time in God's word. You're coming on a Sunday, you're worshiping a powerful move of God, a message is spoken, and you go your way. 
Maybe during the week you get a few tweaks from, you know, famous pastors. You get a few devotionals here and there. And it's like eating a candy bar every now and then. It's sweet. It tastes good. I mean, it touches the lips. But the reality is it's not nourishing you. It's not transforming you. It's not healthy just to eat candy bars all the time. I mean, I would love that, right? But we know, we know that that's not what God would want when it comes to the Word. Now, I love what Joshua says. Look here, Joshua 1.8. Joshua says, do not let this book, the Scripture, the Word of God, don't let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate, circle, meditate on it. Meditate on it day and night. Meditate on, meditate on it so that you may be careful to do everything everything written in it, then, so when we meditate, when we concentrate, when we allow it to go through us, and we're going to show you what that looks like today, it says, then you will know what to do. You'll be careful to do what is written. You'll stay on the path, and then your life will be prosperous and successful. God wants you to succeed. He wants you to walk in freedom. He wants you to have an abundant life. How do you live in freedom? How do you walk an abundant life? Is you meditate on the Word. You let the Word get in you. You let the Word change you. You let the Word guide you. You get wisdom from the Word. Am I in a Pentecostal church? Am I in a church that's hearing me today? Come on. we got to get into the Word, and it'll help you be prosperous. Why? It's because you're walking in God's prosperity, which is peace. I'm not talking financially. Yes, it'll lead to that when your life is in line, when you're walking in the ways of God. But you'll have peace, and that peace passes all understanding. Amen and amen to that. I love what Paul says. Paul says it another way in Romans 12.1. I love this passage. I preach it on it probably once a month. I know, I know, I know. Because I love what Paul says in Romans. He reminds us of what we must do if we're going to be transformed by the Word. And, and here it is, Romans 12, 2. He says, do not, do not conform, underline it, any longer to the pattern of this world. What's the pattern of this world? It's, it's the ways of the world. What's the world? Well, it's the ways that the ungodly go. It's the ways of, of, of those that haven't decided to be a Christ follower. They're not walking with God. They're not walking in the ways of God. They're not separating uh, from the sins of the world. And they're walking in the ways of the world. And so he says, don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world. So what he is saying is that if you're going to be transformed and if you're going to allow the Word to transform you, meditation in the Word, getting anchored in the Word, starts by stopping conformity to the image of the world. We must stop being conformed. Write it down. If you're going to be changed and renewed and strengthened and what God wants, then you must determine. And by the way, I've learned that you determine beforehand. You determine before you get into temptation. You determine before you get into situations that you're not going to walk after the values of the world. You're not going to embrace the values of this world. You're not going to adopt them because you're of a different world. You are not carnal. You're spiritual. You're not led by the carnal man, but you're a spirit man that's led by the Spirit of God, your spirit connects with God's Spirit, and that guides you and leads you. And therefore, we've got to be guided. We've got to be guided not by the values of the world, but by our convictions, by the values of God, by the Word of God. And so he goes on, Romans 2, goes on to show us that we are not to conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed. Underline it. Circle it. Transform, the original word there is, it's a metamorphosis. A metamorphosis is taking place within you. There is a change. You see, you don't clean up the outside 
and then come to Christ. You clean up inwardly. You come to Christ and let a metamorphosis take place, a, a change take place. Every time I read this passage and I talk about transformation, I, I can't help but think about the old farmer that came to the big city for the very first time. He brought his wife, his son, and, you know, and they'd come from the hard fields. They were older, came to the city for the very first time. The wife was checking them in at the counter. He was walking around amazed. You know, he was, you know, he was in one of these big five star, you know, uh, New York City hotels. And as he was walking around there, he saw this silver door open up and inside went a bunch of people, you know, and a little old lady stepped inside that elevator as well. The doors closed. And then a few minutes later, the doors opened again. And this beautiful blonde came walking out of those doors. He looked to his son and said, son, go get your mama. <laughs> It was a metamorphosis in his mind. It was a change that took place. Now, we know it was an elevator, but he didn't know that. Well, a change, a metamorphosis starts inside. There is a change that happens in you and me. That change begins to transform you. And when it transforms you, it will begin to change your life, what you've done, how you've done it, the way you've lived, the things you've believed, attitudes that you've embraced. It'll change you. How many people, let's be honest, you raise your hand if you want. How many people, someone has looked at you in the last couple of years and said, you're different. Something's different. Something's changed. God, I mean, I, what is it? Something's happening. Raise your hand. If someone has looked at you, if someone's not saying you've changed, then, then there's not a metamorphosis maybe taking place. But something happens and people start to see it. You weren't like you used to be. Amen. You're not what God wants you to be uh, totally, but this is a journey of transformation because it's a metamorphosis change of renewing, renewing the mind, renewing the spirit soul is being transformed because of the work of Christ. So he says, stop being conformed and start being transformed transformed into the image of Christ, into the likeness of Christ. Now, how do you do that in meditation? Let me just give you a couple, uh, a couple examples. It's when you're doing your devotions, you begin to visualize the passage. Put yourself into the story. Begin to visualize that biblical situation. Maybe take on the character, one of the characters that are in the story. For example, if we're talking about the woman at the well, ladies, put yourself in her shoes. Put, her, put yourself there when Jesus says to her, you've already had five husbands and the one that you're living with is not your husband. Put yourself there and how you would have felt, right? The, the condemnation and the feeling. You put yourself there. And then all of a sudden, Jesus begins to speak through all of that guilt, shame. And that's what he does, right? He comes to us. He speaks through your guilt. He speaks through your shame. He speaks through your condemnation. You put yourself in the story. Guys, maybe put yourself in the shoes of the disciples. You come back and Jesus is talking to a woman that in that time would have been unacceptable for him to be talking to. All of a sudden, you begin to picture yourself in the story. I picture myself as a pastor, as a leader. I picture myself in what happened afterward. Her life was so transformed that she went back and she told the whole town and village that you've got to come see the this man that I've met. <laughs> now, those ladies were probably thinking, another man? You've already had five. You're living, where's my husband? Where's, where's my husband? You know, you know, this woman, I mean, those ladies were probably thinking, what are you talking about? And sure enough, though, they came and God transformed their life. And they said to the woman, now we believe not because you say so, but because we've experienced it ourselves. You see, all of a sudden, you put yourself in the story, and when you put yourself in the story, it begins to transform you. But if you're doing a quick read, you're not observing like we talked about, you're not, you're not interpreting, you're not applying it, you're not taking time to digest it, thoughtful thinking, it doesn't transform your life. It takes time. If there's one key word in this message today is don't rush your time with God. Take time with the Lord. Let me use another illustration here. Your life 
Let's say your life is like this water that I'm pouring into this floor everywhere. <laughs> Sorry, Miss CEO over here. CEO pouring it all in here. So here we go. Now, your life is like this water. Now, if this represents spending time with the Word, like these tea bags, if you just dip in to the Word, it doesn't have much change in your life. Some of you are just dipping into the Word. You'll have a few tweets, a few social posts. You'll look at a few things that others say. Maybe, maybe you even listen to a little bit of Pastor Tom's preaching when you're not here. Just a little bit, and then you pop back out. It doesn't have the impact, a little bit of impact. And the problem is, and this is what I'm concerned about as a pastor, is we've gotten used to this as though this is normality. This is what God desires. This is not the kind of transformation that God wants in our lives. There's so much more that he's desiring. There's a whole nother level of transformation that he wants to transform you by the renewing of your mind. You see, a little dip here and there is not going to transform you to the place, and you'll continue to be conformed to the world. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to teach you how to soak in the Word, how to get into the Word, to let the Word change you. You come to a worship service. You go to a life group. You do your devotions, right? You come to a night of worship, right? You get into the prayer times. You get into the Word of God in your devotions. You soak in His Word. And when you begin to soak, look, it begins to transform. And that's what God wants. So... Open your Bible, reflect on it, pause, pray, allow God's Word to change you. Don't be in a hurry. Maybe have a little journal or study book where you write some thoughts down. You've got to, first of all, meditate on the Word. Secondly, write it down. If we're going to be transformed, it requires us to memorize the Word. Memorize. Now, it just got really, really quiet. No, pastor, we're writing our notes. Nah, this is a missing discipline of the faith. Memorizing the Word. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 7, guard my words as the most precious possession. Write them down and awesome, keep them deep within your hearts. You see, transformation comes when the Word of God is in you, not just in your pocket, not just in words on a book, but it's in your heart. It'll help you make wise decisions. It'll help you when you're stressed, when you're pressured. It will guide you and lead you. It'll comfort you. Psalms 119, we read it. Verse 11, I have hidden your words in my heart. Why? So that I will not sin against you. The Word of God in you will help you fight temptation when the enemy comes at you. You'll pull the Word just like Jesus pulled the Word in the desert when Satan himself was tempting. He brought the Word. He brought the Word. He brought the Word. How do you fight the enemy? You bring the Word. You bring it up. You bring it up. You bring it up. And it comes up when you've memorized it. It comes up when it's in you. It comes up because you've meditated upon it and it's there to help you. In fact, the Bible says always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. To be ready to give a reason, an answer of the peace that you have. How do you do that? How do you give a word? Someone the other day, uh, we took our pastors on a retreat, and one of the waiters said to us when he found out we were pastors, he says, you know, my roommate is an atheist, and, 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 I, and I need to know what to say, and I don't know what to say. And he was struggling. He was a young believer. He said he grew up in the church, but you could tell he was a very immature believer in not knowing the Word. But when the Word's in you, you don't struggle. When the Word's in you, someone's walking through something, you release a scripture to them. You give them life. And you don't say, oh, let me go study my Bible and find an answer and come back, it's already in you. It's life. It's active. It's coming alive and it's coming out. And so you got to memorize 
the Scripture. So I want to give you a couple of tips on how to memorize since this is a lost discipline. We are not memorizing the Word like we need to. So first of all, I want to encourage you. On the back of your outline are 20 verses every believer must know. They're easy verses. You must know them. You must memorize them. They must be on your heart. They must be there. They must come from your lips. You must very easily be able to speak it uh, uh, in your spirit. I want to also say, I would encourage you to also memorize every scripture that would help someone learn, help you to learn, and help someone to know how to meet Christ. Learn evangelism scriptures. Learn the Romans road. Learn how to share your faith because you don't have time when you're in the elevator, when you're at a table, when you meet somebody, it's got to come out instantly from you. So, how do you memorize? Well, let me give you a couple tips. We're going to practice here. First of all, you always start with the reference. You always say the reference. Matthew 7, 24. Matthew 7, 24. Then we say the scripture. We memorize the scripture. Then say Matthew 7, 24 again. Read it several times aloud. Whatever verse you're going to be memorizing, read it aloud. Hear it emphasize key words. I do that as I preach. Key words help me to remember, helps me to grab it, soaks into my spirit. It gets there. It gets anchored down. It takes hold really tight into the bedrock of my soul. So let's practice. Matthew 7, 24 is our scripture that we're going to practice with. Here's what I'm saying. The scripture says, we're going to read it out loud. Read it together with me. Therefore, Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Matthew 7, 24. So if I was trying to memorize this, this is the scripture I've chosen. I would say Matthew 7, 24. I start with the reference. I'll end with the reference. Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, there's kind of a break. Therefore, now you already know from last week, when therefore is there, you ask which question? What's it there for? What was that author, Matthew 7, what are they talking about up in the upper verses? But that's what we're talking about today. That was review. Therefore, let everyone, let everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. You put it in simple phrases, and you just keep saying it over and over. If you work on that for a week, you don't even need a week. You can learn that in a couple days, right? When you say it over and over. How do you say it over and over? Put it, ladies, put it in the kitchen. Put it on your desk, put it in your car where you're driving, and you practice saying it. When you say that three or four times a day, for three or four days, it locks in your mind. Matthew 7, 24, say it together with me again. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So we memorize the word. And then lastly, thirdly, because of our time, I won't dig too deep here. But lastly, I want to encourage you to use different methods to study the word. Get out of the rut. Use different methods. Break the rhythm. Some of you only take a devotional, and I'm glad you do this, but I want it to come much more alive. I want you to go deeper. I want you to be mature. Some of you, you take our devotions. We, we provide several. Right now, we're walking through our Anchor Devotional Guide, and if you haven't picked this up yet, uh, I believe it's online. You can get it on our Facebook. We have the hard copy at the back table uh, for a reduced uh, price, I think. Uh, you can get this. Don't hold me to that. <laughs> but it's on the back table. Uh, you can get it. And uh, um, by the way, we give you the memory verses that we've been learning every week. And some of you have been walking through that. And that's good. It's a good start. Some of you are reading you version. You're reading through. You're trying to read through the Bible. And that's good. I'm glad you're doing that. But can I tell you, the more you walk with God, the more you're going to have to vary it up. 
the more you're going to have to use different methods for not only the Word to come alive, but for also the enabling of you to learn different things in a much deeper way. So we've list different types of Bible study methods. Now, I use all of these types at different times. Throughout the year, I'll use two or three different methods. I always have running the devotional method. I'm always reading through a devotional guide. Always, usually, I'm reading through the devotional guide that we provide for you. We give these uh, for, I think, $1 every quarter. Uh, we've provided for you personalized devotions that all of us can, uh, can go through. And so the devotional method is always a method that I'm working with. I'm, I'm walking through uh, in my own life. Then there's the character quality method. I've talked about this before where I study character qualities in the Word and I allow those character qualities to begin to be something that I evaluate in my own life. And I begin to say, am I living that quality? Am I, am I living that out? Am I, am, is, is the Word of God transforming me that I'm taking on that characteristic, that biblical characteristic? There's biographical studies. Biographical studies are where you look at characters in the Bible. You look at the life of David, Solomon, Esther, Ruth, and you study their life. You study the strengths of their life, the weaknesses of their life, and you begin to apply the principles of their life to your life. So you pull that out. Sometimes I study a entire book of the Bible in its entirety. I'll read through the book of James, Colossians. I just did a few weeks ago. I'll do Ephesians. I'll do an Old Testament book. And I want to understand the whole book, the problems with social media, the problem with preaching is we drop into a verse of the Bible and then we pull back out of it to make a point. But we've got to get the entire book. When you read 1 Corinthians, you've got to know when you're reading 1 Corinthians that Paul was responding to problems that was in the church. And his letter to the church in Corinth was to address those problems. And so now I've got to begin to ask when I read it, do we have those problems? Am I having that problem? Is there an issue in my life, my family, our church that I've got to live out? In? And so you study a whole book of the Bible. Now, this is my suggestion. There's a lot of different methods there. I don't have time now to unpack it. But those methods vary up your study of the Word. Every day, I want to encourage every day, spend at least 10 or 15 minutes studying the Word character quality, a biographical study, a chapter of the Bible, a, uh, you know, in-depth verse study. Every day, try to spend 10, 15, 20 minutes. That is the, the basic. But then I want to encourage you once a, once a week, if you can, do a little bit deeper study, a more in-depth study. Now, if you need help, this is where we help you. Because on Wednesday night, we have School of Discipleship. The prerequisite for School of Discipleship is the encounter. But you go through School of Discipleship, and I guarantee you, it's going to take you deep. It's going to take you deep in the Word of God. And you're going to unpack it and learn it, digest it, and it's going to transform you. If you've already been through School of Discipleship, we have School of Ministry where you can study deeper and you take a little bit longer time to digest the Word. So our action step today, our action step, the three keys, say it with me, is meditate, memorize, and use different methods, different methods. Here is our action step. Action step number one is start memorizing Scripture. I've given you 20 of the most, uh, most popular memory verses that you must memorize. Put them on a flashcard. Get somebody to hold you accountable. Turn to your neighbor. Say, test me next week. Test me next week. Test me next week. Test me next week. You know, hold each other accountable. Memorize the Word. And then secondly, I want to encourage you to take time. Take time time to meditate on the Word of God. If you can hear me in these closing moments, is don't rush. Don't rush your time with God. Good Bible study demands preparation, focused attention, focused time. 
having a time every day, having intense time once a week at least where you can dive deeper, but where you're just allowing the Word to transform you. Can I hear an amen? amen? Stand with me across this auditorium. Give the Lord a praise as you're standing today. Here at the end of the service, we did the same at the first service. Because of the move of God, which is a little bit, you know, not the norm exactly of how the Spirit moves in our services every week, we're opening some time around these altars where the worship team is going to continue to minister in song. And if you would like deeper prayer, you'd like to just soak like the tea bag a little bit more in the presence of the Spirit. You know, water is likened to the Holy Spirit. And when we soak in His presence, He just begins to flood our soul, our spirit. Maybe today, before you rush out, maybe before you rush off to other commitments that you have, maybe you just want somebody to pray with you. You need to spend a little bit more time connecting with God and letting His Spirit touch you and refresh you, then I want you to know our altars are going to be open. Pastor Candy and her team is going to be here, and we're going to be ministering to you if you've got special need, if you want to just, you know, linger in the auditorium and just soak in His presence. I encourage you to do that today as God has been moving in a very, very specific way. As we close, will you bow your head with me? Father, I thank you for your word today. It's powerful. It's anointed. Your word is sharper than a two-edged sword, and it anchors us, it teaches us, it leads us. And today, I thank you that we're being led by your Spirit. Teach us how to grow in you, how to walk in you, how to, Father, have a vibrant, dynamic relationship with you. And your word today, I pray, will become an anchor in our spirit and in our soul that will bring the life that you desire in each and every one of your believers. Now say with me, say it together, say it loud, our closing prayer. Say, Father, help us to be the people and the church you have called us to be. People that always build up and never tear down, that always encourage and never discourage. A people and a church take a message of hope everywhere we go to everyone we meet. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. When mighty waves come rushing in, my God will